this car is real. Oh, Jim will know. It's real. It's real! I'm sorry, this festival is a really big thing around here. Big isn't the word for it. <laughs> what? Oh, nothing. I'm sure this seems pretty silly to you. No. No, not at all. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes, I admit it. Yes, at first, all this seemed a little uh, nutty. But I think I get it now. I guarantee this, if you love the Andy Griffith show, you're gonna love Mayberry Man. You guys, you have a movie theater in this town, right? Oh yeah, we got a real, real nice one down on Main Street. Yeah. They did some renovations last year and moved the ladies room from the second level down to the lobby level. Real classy move. Okay, that's great, Barney. Uh, I got some things I gotta do, so. Oh, I get it, I get it. Well, real nice to meet you there, Chris Stone. And remember, no jaywalking. It's such a great, feel-good family movie. Thing that we need right now in America, really. We grew up watching that show, and this movie really brought it home as to how much it really is about Americana right now. We loved it. And I thought the uh, Mayberry Man was one of the greatest uh, <laughs> films I've seen in a long time, and I would recommend it to anybody. The Mayberry and the show. Remind us of the time when things were simpler, yeah. when folks were friendlier to one another, yeah. and just laying back in the grass and looking up, watching the clouds roll across the sky was enough. <laughs> you see, Mayberry isn't just a place; it's it's a state of mind. Everybody, I'm looking at you. If you are watching this right now, you need to go see Mayberry, man. I don't care what age you are, what race you are, what your background is, it doesn't matter. You go see Mayberry, man, because it's all awesome. here. He's one of our savage killers now. <laughs> 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 That's the greatest thing I've ever saw. Mayberry Man resonated with me. Everything the show represented, all the good stuff, being a better person because you're from Mayberry. And it's the kind of movie I'd like to see. And the wonderful thing about the story is it involves the people that come to Mayberry Days and sort of become the characters. It puts a smile on my face. They, they just, they kill, they knock it dead. Hey, welcome to Wednesday Night Live, co-host Alan Newsom. Alan, good to see you. Hey, it's good to be here. It's always good. All right. Well, tonight we have a, kind of a special treat. We're going to be showing a video or video clips um, uh, that feature Hoke Howell, who is my father, who played Dud Wash on the Andy Griffith Show. And uh, he's kind of the whole reason we're, we have this Mayberry Man thing, right? I mean, that's, right. that's where it all started. So I thought, um, you know, a while back, Stark had put together, found a bunch of clips on the internet and, and kind of put it all together. But I thought I would narrate it. And so, uh, you know, for copyright reasons, we can't show a lot of clips in, in, in their entirety. So uh, we've got a lot of visuals and I've got some narration to go with it and a few clips here and there. Um, so we're going to do that tonight. Uh, it's going to be in two parts. So uh, so stick around. We'll have an intermission. Uh, <laughs> but I did want to let people know uh, the news that uh, Mayberry Man, the movie, uh, was nominated or a finalist in the ICVM Crown Awards for Best Comedy. Now, this is a uh, sort of a faith-based uh, award ceremony that takes place at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. And uh, so that was great news to be, uh, to be included. Uh, it's not overtly a faith-based film, uh, but it's certainly faith-friendly and it's uh, consistent with all that. Wouldn't you say so, Alan? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was, I was excited to hear about that. 
I guess late last week's when I found out about it. And uh, yeah, that was big news. Uh, yeah. And I, I think we definitely fit into the faith and family genre because yeah. uh, there's definitely nothing that happens in Mayberry that wouldn't happen at church. So I think we're okay. Yeah. Well, except Otis drinking. Well, you know, we love Otis and we work <laughs> with him. We try to mold him, you know, and try to help him through. So, I mean, I think that shows a good Christian attitude. You're, you're, you're not judging him. You're, you're trying to help him. That's right. All right. Well, um, so fasten your seatbelts. Uh, we're going to go uh, back in time, a little time capsule, and uh, just check out some of the parts. I mean, we don't have everything, right? It's like you can't get access to everything. There's a lot of clips that, uh, uh, but you may not be familiar with. So uh, hopefully it'll, uh, you'll find it interesting. So here we go. Hulk Howell, of course, is best known to our audience as Dud Wash in The Andy Griffith Show. But he had a long career that started professionally in New York and then continued in Hollywood. These are just a few clips from the more than 200 TV shows and films that he appeared in over the course of his career. Now, Hulk would go on to play a lot of gas station attendants, which became a running joke in the Howell household. In fact, I believe his first professional role in Hollywood in 1961 was a gas station attendant in The Hustler, starring Paul Newman and Jackie Gleason. He had a few lines of dialogue, but you never really see his face, and he didn't even get screen credit for the role. But things did improve, and Dennis the Menace in 1962, he played a soda jerk, uh, which was a nice comedic role for him. Ah, uh, what'll it be, young lady? One small glass of water, please. A small glass of water? Yeah. Uh, with everything on it? One small glass of water, please. A small glass of water coming up. And then, of course, in 1963, he did two episodes as Dud Wash in The Andy Griffith Show. Now, he did the episode that introduced the Darling family, where he shows up at the end to reunite with Charlene Darling. There's Dud. <laughs> and, of course, Mountain Wedding, which is one of the more popular episodes in the entire series. Well, you let him just try. Boy, I'll show him a couple of things I learned in the Army in guerrilla warfare. First, you take your hand and yank his right around and then you take your hand and yank it. <laughs> An episode that also introduced Ernest T. Bass. Stop that waiting! In 1964, he did the Jack Benny Show. In this sketch, Jack Benny is playing Paul Revere and his wife is played by Lucille Ball. Paul! Huh? Huh? What is it? The British are coming. There was one light in the church tower. That means they're coming by land. You've got to warn the people. And uh, she won't let him out for the night, and Hoke shows up to tell him it's time to ride. I'm not going to stand here arguing with you. I'm going. Oh, yeah? Yes. And I'm going to go right now, too. <laughs> In 1964, he showed up in McHale's Navy in a scene with Tim Conway, and he's playing a Frenchman with some sort of ridiculous looking mustache and a French accent to match. Hey, hey, the money, the payroll, where is it? Money, monsieur? Oh, has any of you seen this officer's money? No, no, we have seen nothing, monsieur, not even a suit. In 1964, he shows up in Bob Hope Chrysler Theater, which is one of the last major anthology TV series, uh, this one with Roddy McDowell. And of course, he's playing a gas station attendant. Uh, just just don't, don't shoot, fella, because uh, I'm, I'm a family man. <laughs> hey, come back here. But all I wanted was some gas. It looks like Roddy was ready for the pandemic. In this episode of The Munsters from 1965, the Munsters pet dragon Spot that normally lived under the stairs, uh, Spot gets out and gets lost in the sewer system and Herman goes looking for Spot and runs into some sewer workers, but uh, of course they get freaked out and uh, Hoke shows up as a news reporter. The people of this city are frightened and they're demanding some kind of official action. Next, we have Bonanza in 1966 with Michael Landon and Lorne Green. I hear tell you gotta stomp them grapes to get the juice. Old Hoss has sure got the feet for stomping. I'm gonna do a little stomping in your direction if you don't shut up. 
Now, when he wasn't antagonizing the Cartwrights, you might find him playing a police officer, like in this 1967 episode of Green Acres with Eddie Albert and Ava Gabor. Uh, may I see your license, please? Uh, yes, sir. I'm a little embarrassed about this. Oh, well, so am I. Next, we have Lost in Space from 1968. During our Mayberry Man crowdfunding campaign, which is still active, by the way, on Indiegogo, we offered a digital copy of our father's shooting script from this episode. This was one of Hoke's more over-the-top performances, in my opinion. On your feet, Corporal Ray Alert! Then in 1968, Hoke landed his first television series as a regular in Here Come the Brides, which was a TV series starring teen heartthrob of the day, Bobby Sherman, along with David Soule, who would later become Hutch in Starsky and Hutch. Brides, as the cast and crew called it, ran for two seasons starting in 68, and it was a huge break for Hoke because being an actor can be feast or famine, and so every actor's dream is to be a series regular. It's good money and a steady paycheck doing what you love to do week after week. <laughs> What's wrong? We, you, I just came in to get a drink, man. To get the chill out of me balls. Well, of all the dumb things. I never heard of anything so dumb in all my life. Clancy, you are really dumb. That takes us into the 70s with the Brady Bunch. Where are y'all folks headed for? Grand Canyon. Boy, that place sure gets crowded this time of year. Yeah. Even the squirrels need reservations. <laughs> In this classic episode where they're on their way to see the Grand Canyon, and there he is playing a gas station attendant, but Hope gives them directions to a ghost town where they uh, get into a little bit of trouble. All right, you kids, now don't let a ghost get you. <laughs> In 1971, Hoke plays a racehorse in Bewitched. Uh, that's, of course, after Samantha, Elizabeth Montgomery, turns the horse into a human so she can ask him why he's losing so many races. How, how did you do that? I'm a witch. Oh, sure, and I'm Pegasus. <laughs> and I'm sorry, did you notice his makeup? It looked like they sort of did a kind of a little blackface thing with the makeup to match the color of the horse. This will be my last race. I'm not as dumb as I look. Well, okay, moving on. <laughs> then there's Columbo in 1971. How did you know that, Ben? Oh, come on, Sergeant. Doc Webster told us. All right, so there was a bruise. You know, a lot of people say that they hear Hoke's voice from the television before they see him on screen, and they know instantly that it's Hoke Howell. And in this episode, if you blink, you do miss him, but you hear that voice. In 1972, there was a TV movie starring Dennis Weaver called Rolling Man. Uh, and then in 73, Slaughter's Big Ripoff, starring Jim Brown and Ed McMahon. This scene didn't turn out too well for Hoke's character. In fact, that image of him being choked out by Jim Brown even became the focal point for the artwork inside the record album for the movie's soundtrack. Yeah, wait, wait a minute, wait. All right. And so welcome to intermission. <laughs> uh, for intermission, I thought I would uh, show this. This is a box of milk duds because, you know, you get stuff at the intermission that Hoke Howell actually signed for me <laughs> a few years ago because he was dud wash. There, there right. we go. So I, I can't remember. Were, were the milk duds in the, in the box when you got it? or uh... They're not now. <laughs> but, uh, I honestly don't remember. He may have eaten them. I have no idea. <laughs> so there's, I mean, there's obviously a lot of other titles that we're skipping over. Um, you can look at his, even his IMDb page doesn't list everything he was in. Uh, Cause I do remember it was well over 200 uh, titles and uh, there's maybe well, over hundred. I just wanted on. to say though, that I heard you say something about his mustache and uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> it kind of hit home. I'm not so sure. Yeah, well, he didn't grow his own. <laughs> so, so don't take it personally. I, I didn't, but I was like, wow, it doesn't look that bad. No, <laughs> I mean. Well, it matched the accent. That was my, <laughs> my point. Um, all right, so I've got a couple of longer clips in this uh, second uh, video. Um, so one of them, it's, uh, uh, you'll hear me explain. It's uh, something that never aired. Uh, even though you might say it aired on the internet. Uh, as far as I know, it never aired uh, because the show was canceled. So I really let this scene play out because most people have probably never seen it. And I just think it was one of his better 
roles uh, as a guest star on a, on a series. And uh, toward the end, um, I let one of his final films kind of play out a little bit. Just uh, there's a there's a reference or a, there's a Barney Fife reference in the final scene. So stick around for that. So let's take a look at part two. Then there's Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. It was a TV series based on a film by the same title, and this was 1973. The series starred Robert Urich and Ann Archer, among others, and it was actually canceled in the first season before Hoax episode even aired. In fact, it wasn't even being finished edited. But somehow, uh, my father got his hands on a copy of the rough cut on VHS tape. So this clip, uh, while technically the quality is lacking a little bit, but it is one of my favorite performances by my father. Take a look. I think uh, left. Yeah, <laughs> Come on, let's talk about this, huh? Now listen, you're entitled to your opinion. Look, I didn't call you a thief. A man walks into a big city office wearing a cowboy suit and a western hat. I got nothing against your clothes. Well, what is it then? Is, is it my down-home accent? Of course not. <laughs> Would you please stop accusing me? Listen, let's just lay it right out on the line. I mean, you're a smart man, big city lawyer, and you cannot see how anybody could sell prime Kansas City corn-fed beef at my prices. As a matter of fact... Unless he was some kind of a crook, a con man, or Lord help us all, even a cattle rustler. <laughs> I, I'm old, I'm old, I've been honest with you. Now, I want you to be honest with me. Isn't that what you're thinking? Yes, yes, I did think that. All right, then there's no use in us wasting each other's time any further. You have a nice day, him. Huh? How do you sell prime beef at those prices? Oh, by eliminating the middleman. What middleman? Well, the shipper, the packer, the wholesaler, and the supermarket. Now, that ain't too hard to understand, is it? Yeah, but where, you, where do you get the, uh, the meat, the cows? I'm a cattleman. Yeah, how do you get them here? Well, I hit them up, move them out. Don't you ever go to the movie club? Well, I guess it sounds logical. I mean, what you're, what you're saying is that you've managed to uh, cut your overhead, huh? No, I ain't what I'm saying at all. What I'm trying to tell you is that I am being squeezed. Now, sit down there. I want to show you something. You got another minute? Sure. Come on. you got to look at this. Yeah, take a look at that. Is that your family? Left to right there, that's, that's Billy Ralph, Gene Roy, that's my wife, Lainey, Jojo, old Big Carl, <laughs> and Tad Poe and J.D., that's the twins, and, and that little fella on the crutches there. <laughs> that's the wit. It's uh, very nice. Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm real proud of them. I tell you, you folks here in Los Angeles County may not realize it, but times are hard. I'm just trying to feed my young'uns the best way I know how. Maybe I owe you an apology. <laughs> no, sir, you don't owe me a thing. No, 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 I want you to understand. You see, I feel that as a consumer, we have responsibility. You bet. Now, I know that nobody gets anything for nothing. Right again. Now, as an attorney, I felt that I had to ask you these questions. Oh, shoot, I respect you for that. Good, just so you understand. Now, let's talk prices. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, sir. Now, here's my price list. I want you to... I just wish that episode would have aired because I think it would have led to more comedic opportunities for him. By the way, he did end up being a cattle rustler in that episode. Now, I remember the mid-70s being pretty lean in the Howell household. Things slowed down for him a bit with just a handful of bit parts on various TV series. Uh, there was Kung Fu in 1975, The Blue Knight in 76. Well, I am not. Drunk. Well, I'm glad to hear that. No, you, you don't believe me. I can prove it to you. I tell you, you, you give, give me a pass. Give okay. me a pass. Mickey Mouse, a dog or a cat? Mickey Mouse, a dog or a cat. Let me think. Uh, yeah, it was left before I'm 90 to be you and I got the corner of 7th and Alvarado. Well, I don't make any, any sense, does it? I mean, it's like, it's like Porky Pig, right. Tweety Bird, right. Mickey Mouse. It's a, it's a mouse. Right. It's a mouse, doesn't it? Well, I got it. But then in 77, uh, he was in two episodes of the first season of Chips with Eric Estrada and Larry Wilcox, John and Punch. Uh, the first appearance was actually the pilot episode where he plays a Texas tycoon trying to avoid speeding tickets by warding off radar. Then he shows up later in the same season as a truck driver whose glue truck overturned on the freeway. 
Also in 1977 was Kingdom of the Spiders, a movie starring William Shatner about a town being taken over by spiders. And yes, he does play a gas station attendant. Oh, say, listen, can I help you with something, Mary? Right? No, you just go on and do what you're doing. I'm fine. Oh, I appreciate that. God almighty! Now that was a pretty authentic reaction right there. I heard that exact exclamation from Hoke many times throughout my life. And I remember my father saying that that spider seemed pretty mad by the time they finished filming that scene. And the whole earth reeled and it rocked and rolled a little because he was angry. And still in 1977, we have Ron Howard's directorial debut, Grand Theft Auto. Hope was cast as the preacher. This was a fun Roger Corman picture with uh, some great stories behind it too. Uh, they talk about it in the book, The Boys, Ron and Clint Howard's book. And uh, we also have a video on our YouTube channel with Clint Howard talking about uh, the making of this film. Amen. And it's also my first time on the big screen. My dad took me to the set on the days they filmed the big demolition derby sequence, and I made it into the background as an extra a couple of times. And on a side note, I just read that they are about to demolish the Saugus Speedway in Santa Clarita, California, where they filmed that demolition derby to make way for some new developments. Definitely the end of an era. Atlanta. Now in 1979, we have the Dukes of Hazard, And if you knew my dad, the last thing he would ever want is to be put in a casket. That's literally the reason he gave for wanting to be cremated when he passed away. But the Duke boys didn't seem to care. Then now we're into the 80s and 1980 with Humanoids from the Deep. Not a bad movie, pretty creepy, but I thought the best thing was how well they cast my father's son in the film. Definitely a resemblance. Hoke continued to show up regularly on TV shows throughout the 80s. He did a couple of Happy Days episodes with Ron Howard, of course, uh, The Fall Guy with Lee Majors, Remington Steele with Pierce Brosnan, and there was an episode of Webster with Emmanuel Lewis where he's playing a clown. And I'm, I'm sure he didn't like being put into that trunk any more than he did the casket. What are you spraying? What are you spraying? <laughs> And then in 1990, he appeared in Another 48 Hours, starring Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte. It was a pretty cool part because the first face you see on screen is an extreme close-up of Hoke. And you can imagine being in a movie theater, you know, a giant screen, and it's just like, bam, right there in your face. So uh, that was fun for him, uh, but it doesn't end well for him. I, I don't think he even survived the opening credits. And then in 1992, he appears in Ron Howard's Far and Away, uh, starring Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. A lot of good stories behind that film as well. The Howard family was all involved, and uh, a pretty good flick, I think. And then in 93, he shows up in Geronimo, starring a young Matt Damon. And this was a pretty good scene, too. Now, he continued to make uh, additional films late in his career. He passed away in 1997, um, but there's a lot of credits. You can check them out on IMDb, but we just thought it'd be fun to show you a few clips and uh, just to take a trip down memory lane. This is reality, so you just move on. No sale here, Mr. Security. Day. 
So that last one was The Alarmist with David Arquette. And um, he had a pretty big part in that. But I, as I recall, and I could be mistaken because he did a few films that year. Um, but that might have been one where he was like starting to feel really bad, ill, you know, at the end of his life there. And uh, I think he like went to them and said, we got to wrap shooting today because he wasn't going to be feeling up for the next day. So, you know, he worked uh, as long as he could, you know, like a lot of these actors. Wow. So I had some questions in the chat room. Uh, yeah. Don Good asked, uh, what did you boys call your dad? Did you call him pop, dad, father, hope? Dad. 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 I try to go out of my way to use other terms so it doesn't sound like I'm always saying dad. But we always said dad, yeah. 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 That was, I thought that was a good question. And, uh, Mike McGonigal, he actually asked, uh, did Hoke embellish his Southern accent or, for his roles or did he really have, have that strong of a Southern accent? So, uh, you know, he is from South Carolina and, uh, he went to New York, the Academy of Dramatic Arts and, uh, probably paid a lot of money to lose his Southern accent. And then he ended up playing Southerners, you know, <laughs> most of his career. So I don't, I think he was just able to slip right back into it uh, as needed. That's cool. No, th those videos are really good. Really. Thank you for taking the time to narrate them as well. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I remember uh, the, uh, here come the brides. Yeah. I remember that show. There was actually a, uh, this is, this is going into my useful, not useless knowledge trivia. There's a book called Ishmael, a Star Trek book from the, the original series where Captain Kirk and, uh, and Spock go back in time to the uh, coast there in San Francisco. And actually the characters from here come the bride are in that book. So okay. yeah. Cause Mark Leonard who played Spock's father, Sarek on star Trek was on that show as well. So okay. anyway, I was looking, I was trying to see if your dad is in there. <laughs> so I, I don't know, but, uh, but anyway, that's just a useless trivia by Alan. Thank you very much. Yep. And uh, I see someone asked if uh, I ever ran lines with my father. Yes. Uh, on occasion, uh, I would run lines with them. Not, you know, not that often. Uh, when I was older, you know, old enough to do that, he wasn't uh, requiring that service as much. It was, uh, it was, there was t a lot of time would pass between opportunities. It's, uh, it's kind of like when you, when you hear, uh, you know, child actors talk about when they get to a certain age, the work dries up you know, until they get to like the next age category. And I think that happens in adults as well. Once they get into their, you know, late forties, early fifties, there's kind of this dead space, right? They're no longer the thirties, you know, age group. They're not the grandpas, you know? So um, I think that might've been what he was experiencing as well. So um, it's a tough life. You know, he, I always say he worked enough to remain an actor uh, but never enough to like really be so-called successful. Um, like a lot of his friends quit the business because they couldn't do it, you know, but he worked, it was like a slot machine, you know, it just paid out enough to keep him around, <laughs> you know? Well, in the, in the book, the boys, you know, they talk about rants and your dad, uh, yeah. writing partners, they, they would write scripts or story outlines, uh, as part of trying to stay busy. Working. Yeah. And he did write some television scripts. He wrote, uh, I think a few for the series, the rookies. You remember the rookies? I remember that. That was a pretty good show. Yeah. Um, and they wrote some feature length, you know, scripts and, uh, Clint or uh, Ron, uh, Ron's production company bought one of them, but it was never made. Um, but it's tough business, tough business, but he, uh, you know, stuck it out. And, uh, I mean, that's just a, small sampling of his roles. Um, and there's other, I was tr looking for a clip from happy days. So he was in two episodes of happy days. Uh, one of the episodes was um, they're making a television commercial for uh, Howard's uh, hardware store. And so they end up, it's supposed to be the Cunninghams are all supposed to be in the commercial. And then one by one, they start replacing <laughs> each one of them with actors. Uh, my dad was playing a, a customer in the commercial um, and then somewhere along, I don't even know, remember how they introduced this, but, uh, Hank Aaron makes a cameo appearance in the, uh, oh, wow. in the episode. And so, uh, one of my, I don't have a lot of autographs, but one of them that I do have is Hank Aaron's autograph. 
uh, on the back of a, a script page from Happy Days. Wow. That my dad picked up for me that at that one. Another, another prize autograph that I have is uh, on a script page is uh, OJ Simpson. So those are my two. Those are my two autographs. Well, that's a big one to have. I mean, everybody knows who he is, one way or the other. They know who he is. Yeah, he now, did a movie with. He did a movie called The Klansman with O.J. Simpson, wow. which I think got later retitled. But um, <laughs> yeah, I can. And I think Linda Evans played his wife in that in that movie too. So played your played hoax wife. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think so. Wow, good job. Way to go. Let's give him a hand. There we hey, go. I went for that authentic Southern uh, <laughs> call, good. you know, in the Klansman. <laughs> That's good. Uh, if I, now, I didn't see, or uh, maybe I missed it, but the Brady Bunch, he was on there too, right? As, was right. It, so, he, he was a gas station attendant or something in that one too. Yeah, yeah. They were going on a vacation and stopped see, in like a ghost Yeah, town. that was in there. You must have, you must have I, blown okay, I must have missed that. Okay, I ran. I was probably yeah. when I was running over and getting the milk dud box. Oh, well. I think so. Yeah. So yeah. So he uh, was the gas station tenant. They were on their way to the Grand Canyon. Uh, they stop off for gas and they ask if there's anything else to see in the area. And he directs them to the ghost town where they then run into uh, Jim Backus, the, uh, the old uh, uh, prospector. Yeah. yeah. I did see that part. I saw the after I saw that part. I missed the part where it was him. So yeah, it was obviously while I was going to get the milk dead box. Cause I thought intermission. I need, Oh, I've got some milk. Dead. So. so good stuff. So, you know, if, if anybody has any more questions, throw them in there. Um, did Hoke have a second profession? Uh, oddly enough, uh, his second, I would say his second profession was professional poker player. So he would play in these private poker games, uh, you know, I don't know. I didn't see a ledger or anything, but I would assume knowing his financial situation, he wouldn't be playing in those games if he wasn't coming out ahead. Um, another thing that we did that he and I did actually together, uh, we went to the swap meet. You know, he would get like this, this uh, surplus merchandise from some of the guys I think he played poker with and we would go sell it at the swap meet. And uh, it's funny, the Saugus swap meet, which is where the speedway is from the demolition derby, uh, I remember going to that. There was a swap meet there. I remember going with him to that swap meet as well. So, wow. you know, I've been, I went to work with dad uh, at the swap meet and at the, uh, the movie shoot at the same place. So. so Joy's asking, how old were you when you did that? When you appeared in the movie? Uh... I want to say I was around 12. I don't know. Or 11, probably 11. It was 77, I think. Did any so. of the rest of your family, did they do that too? Did they appear in any of the, or did yeah, you? they had different experiences. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Stark and, and my other brother, Scott, they, um, you know, they were around for different celebrity experiences. So they were hanging out with Ron and Clint and, and doing yeah. stuff. So they had more behind the scenes stuff. I mean, Stark has experiences going to Bob Hope's house and, you know, things like that. Whereas, um, you know, I think they may have visited the set, you know, on occasion, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's a, you've been on a movie set. It's, it's not a place for visitors really. No, it's not. Yeah. There's not much to do when, except stay out of the way. <laughs> That's mainly your yeah, job. Exactly. Yeah, don't, uh, don't mess up watch, something. Yes. <laughs> watch the paint dry. Um, someone asked, uh, did he do commercials? Now he did do a few commercials. He would go up for commercials regularly. Um, you know, audition for them, but uh, he just didn't really have that commercial look, you know, I think was the issue. He's a little too much character, you know, commercials are looking for a little cleaner look, I think, even for the, the doofus characters, right? It's like, uh, it's just a different look. Um, but I do recall, I think it was a Ram, or it was some vehicle. I can't remember which vehicle it was. He had a, a car commercial and they told him to, to, they let him drive the car and it was like a prototype for the commercial. Yeah. And he was supposed to drive this truck through a barn. Well, he said, <laughs> so he's driving the truck through the barn and he hit all the uh, chicken excrement and that thing went sliding and he wiped out the entire side of this prototype <laughs> car. <laughs> oh my goodness. So. Um, oh, oh, that's terrible. That's one of the commercials. And I didn't put it in there. I probably should have. Uh, he did a commercial for me. So when I uh, started my career in advertising, uh, he uh, did an Earl Scheib auto painting commercial where I got to, that's the one time I got to direct him. Oh, wow. 
So uh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, Don Good said in here that Happy Days was set in Milwaukee, and uh, Hank would have played there for the Braves during the time that's of true. the Happy yeah. Days. So that's probably how he ended up on the. Well, worst. and and one of the jokes at the end of the episode is, uh, you know. So he's theoretically still playing right at that right. time. And um, the fawn says to him, you know what? I have a feeling he's like, Richie, uh, well, you know, Cunningham, what, what's the record for most home runs? <laughs> so 600, 713. And he turns to Hank and says, you know what? You're going to beat that record. <laughs> and Hank Aaron's like, oh, you crazy kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I think that's the page I have uh, the, from the, uh, the autograph on. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, well, I, that, you know, we could share stories uh, till the cows come home or till the chickens come home. But uh, I want to say thank you for, for uh, joining me, co-hosting Alan. Um, always a pleasure. Glad and to do it. I, I want to thank your dad for having you and Stark, or we wouldn't have had the, the Mayberry Man movie or series or, or this show, actually. Right, uh, yeah. Here. So thank you. Well, no, actually, no. I would say it's you guys, the fans. I mean, when he started going to the fan uh, you know, festivals and things like that, he had no idea. Right. As most of these guys will say, you know, Clint will say it, too. It's like it's like they show up the first time and they, they had no idea that there was this fan base right. that was so uh, supportive and, and loving and involved. And so that's you know, that was Stark's experience when he went to the first Mayberry days, uh, his first Mayberry days. Mm -hmm. um, he's like, there's an opportunity here to do something and, and kind of keep this Mayberry spirit alive. And so that's the purpose behind what we what we've done with the movie and now the series, which a uh, quick update on the series, it's in post-production. We're sort of uh, still trying to nail down our final day of shooting, which will be in the spring. So we're kind of just slowing down a little bit so we can, we want to get that last day of shooting in the can uh, and then we can accelerate the, the final post-production. So, so that's what's happening there. And then uh, we've got some exciting uh, Mayberry events coming up. I know, Alan, you've got the one in Granville, Tennessee in April, correct? Yeah, we and, do, yes. And, and then uh, Mayberry comes to Scottsburg in Indiana. Uh, June. In June. Yeah. And so we're going to have Mayberry Man screenings at those uh, events. And so it's a great time to come out and see Mayberry Man. I don't know. Do they have a theater in Granville? Probably not. It's no, probably they're going to show it outside. It'll be outside. Oh, it's going to be outdoor screening. Yeah, it's going to be an outdoor screening. Uh, and so it's going to be kind of like a, a drive-in movie or something. Yeah, there you go. Okay. You sit in your long chairs and watch or bring a, bring, a, bring a blanket to sit on. There you go. And we'll be doing it outside. We'll probably do some Q and a type things at both events. Uh, so check out, uh, if you can go to imayberry.com and check out the event calendar, you'll be able to find where and when exactly those will be. So you can check those out. And, uh, the Scottsburg event, they have a theater in town and we've actually screened the movie there before. So that'll be good to see it back on the, the big screen. Uh, it's currently, uh, on a lot of small screens, uh, it's on all these different platforms where you could stream it. Uh, you can refer your friends and family if they want to check it out. Uh, Pure Flix, if you're a subscriber, doesn't cost you anything. You're already a subscriber. Uh, the other platforms, it's still for rent or purchase, um, except for, um, uh, is it on there? Hoopla. Hoopla, which is uh, through the library system. You can borrow it at no charge. If you have a library card, sign up for a Hoopla account. Um, so lots of great ways to watch Mayberry Man and keep the Mayberry spirit alive. So uh, until next time, I want to say thanks, everyone, and uh, appreciate you tuning in. And uh, I'm going to post the, the full video of the Hoke Howell stuff separately on our YouTube channel. So if you ever want to come back and just kind of watch that, those highlights, uh, you'll have an op opportunity to do that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Hey, while you're at the YouTube channel, make sure you like and subscribe so you won't miss out on notifications about these live events like this. Well, and I was about to throw it to Clint Howard to oh, also tell you to, to like. Oh, all right. He doesn't say subscribe, but he does say like this video. All right. <laughs> all right. Thanks for joining me, Alan. Thanks, guys. Well, hey, if you just like that clip, hit the like button. There's going to be plenty more. If you want more videos about The Andy Griffith Show, be sure to hit subscribe and click that little bell icon so you're notified whenever we post a new video. Thanks for watching.
Shazam. Come on, baby.